At this point in the course, you should have a solid understanding of iterators in JavaScript. It's now time to learn about a new type of function that produces an iterator. For all of you React developers who use Redux Saga, you already have a general idea of what we'll be going over. and how they work. We'll talk about the special yield keyword available in a generator function, along with the definition of yield delegation. We'll cover how to abort a generator, or complete a generator early. Finally, we'll learn how to handle errors within a generator function. The definition of a generator function is a function that can be paused and resumed at a later time while having the ability to pass values to and from the function at each pause point. Generator functions can run to completion, but they don't have to. Up until now, in JavaScript, a function always ran until completion. Now we can write generator functions that never stop quote unquote running. I put that in quotes because it's not like a generator function is stuck in an infinite loop. It's just that maybe we don't need the rest of the function to execute. The syntax of a generator function isn't all that different from a normal function. We just need to add an asterisk somewhere in between the function keyword and the name of the function. It's not really important where you put the asterisk, it just needs to be before the name. Go ahead and open up a code sandbox so we can write our first generator function. Define a function called timestamp generator. If you're using Prettier, it will most likely position the asterisk for you, leaving you even less to worry about. Let's just console log a timestamp. When we call this function, you may be wondering, why didn't anything happen? nothing logged to the screen. Well, executing a generator function does not execute the containing code. This is an important point to remember with generator functions. Executing the generator function alone does not execute its containing code. It's like if you wanted to watch a TV that is currently turned off. Executing the generator function alone is just like you picking up the remote control. You haven't turned the TV on yet, you've just been given the controller. Executing the generator returns an iterator, or the controller. When you want to turn the TV on, it dot next, or press power on the controller. Now you've started watching TV. You've started the execution. When you execute the function, it returns an iterator that we can control. If you remember from the previous module, to start the iterator, we need to call next. Well, that's exactly what we have to do in this case, too. Now we see a timestamp getting logged. To show that what the generator function returns really is an iterator, let's try a for of loop. I'd expect we see a single timestamp being logged. So for const val of it, and just console log the val here. And yeah, it logs a single timestamp. What would happen if I removed this asterisk and tried the for of loop? We get an error. Undefined is not an iterable. Cannot read property symbol, symbol dot iterator. This is still a very basic example of a generator function. There's an important piece we are missing that really shows us the power of a generator. We want to be able to pause this function. As it is currently, the entirety of the function will execute on the next call. To pause execution, we need the yield keyword. Using the yield keyword tells the function to stop and wait. While it's paused, nothing else will execute until another next call happens. Go ahead and delete the for of loop. Let's add the yield keyword to our timestamp generator function. Then after the yield, we'll print execution continued. When we first call it.next, we get the timestamp being logged. Now the function is paused, waiting for us to resume its execution. When I call it.next again, the rest of the code in this function is executed and we see the execution continued message. There are a couple of other actions that the yield keyword can perform. It can send a value to the iterator and it can receive a value from the iterator. That means you can assign a yield expression to a variable inside of a generator function 
and have the iterator send the value to be assigned to that variable. Yield expressions can be used where pretty much any other normal JavaScript expression is used. Let's head back to the code sandbox and send some additional time to our generator function using yield. Instead of console logging the timestamp at the beginning here, let's assign that value to a variable called ts. Now create a variable called additional time and set the value to yield. Let's log the value of additional time. We'll want to add any additional time to the timestamp we generated, but only if it's defined. So write a check to make sure additional time is defined, then add it to ts. Now we need to pass a value to this yield. So in the second it.next call, we'll pass in one minute's worth of milliseconds, 1000 times 60. We can also update these console logs to be more descriptive. So add additional time to the additional time log, add updated ts to the ts log, and let's add a log for the original timestamp value for comparison. We can also send the value to the iterator using the yield expression. To show this, add a new yield under the original ts log. We'll yield the ts value back to the iterator. Now we can assign that first it.next call to a variable called original timestamp. Log that out to see its value. We also need to add another it.next call due to the additional yield we added. Let's step through this iteration. Comment out all of the it.next calls for now. We'll activate each line one by one so we can see what's happening in the generator with these yield expressions. Uncomment the first it.next call and the console log of the original timestamp. We've started the iterator and should see the log of the original ts coming from the generator function. And since we are passing the ts variable in the first yield here, we also see our iterator result object being assigned to original timestamp. The function is now just waiting for another next call. What do you think will happen when we call next again? I'll uncomment the next call now and nothing. But why did nothing happen? Well, it's sitting and waiting now at the additional time assignment. Here, I'll add another console log after that first yield expression for more clarity. Now you can see that we made it past the first yield and are now waiting at the second yield. Now uncomment the final next call and we get the rest of the function's logs. I want to show an example of a continuously running generator function. What this means is that we are going to have a generator function with a while loop that does nothing but yield values. Create a new empty file called randomNum.js. If you created this sandbox from the vanilla JavaScript template, You'll need to update the index.html file script tag near the bottom to point to random num instead of index.js. Define a generator function called random num at the top, and inside we will add a while loop with an expression of true so that it will always run. Inside the loop, add a yield, and we're going to yield a random number between 0 and 100. So type out math.floor math.random times 100. Since yield will always pause the execution of the function, this while loop won't end up crashing our browser. It will just give us a function that will always give us a new random number whenever I call it. Execute random num and save the iterator to its. Now every time we call it.next, we will get a new iterator result object with a random number. If you wanted to abstract away the need to call next over and over, we could put this iterator into another function which returns that value for us. Create a function named getRandomNumber, and inside we will return the value of an it.next call. Now we just need to execute getRandomNumber. Up next, we'll see more examples of generator functions and introduce yield delegation. Now that we know what a generator function is and how to implement one, we should update some of the console log my food code. 
I think we can reduce the amount of code we have written while at the same time make it more readable. Let's take the list vegan foods case statement and use a generator in place of the custom iterator. The first thing we should do is use await here instead of the callback. Assign the data variable from the awaits response here. Now define a function named list vegan foods and don't forget the asterisk to make it a generator. You can delete the custom iterator vegan iterable, but leave the for of loop for now. We'll keep the IDX variable and the vegan only variable too. Move those inside of our generator function. To make sure our for of loop can still print out each vegan food, our generator function will need to pass a food out to the iterator using the yield keyword. In our previous custom iterator, we were returning that food item in the next method as long as it was defined in the vegan only array. We're going to do something very similar here, but we'll use a while loop. While vegan only still has items available, we'll yield out that item. After we yield, we need to increment our IDX variable to get the next item. Now we just need to update the for of loop to iterate over the iterator returned by the list vegan foods generator. With these changes, we should see the exact same functionality that we had with the custom iterator. Head to the terminal to verify that everything still works. Yep, we're still looking good. The next custom iterator we defined was in the log case, the action iterator. We used this iterator to cycle through an actions array. By instead defining this functionality in a generator function, it'll look more like a standard function call. Instead of an actions array, we would just yield between the functions to have the same functionality. We also wouldn't have to define custom return and throw methods, as those are both defined on generator functions already. Let's start creating a new generator function to replace action iterator. Go ahead and delete the action iterator object and define a generator function called action generator. We'll still need to make sure the food the user enters gets passed into the generator, so we should set our first yield at the top and assign the value passed in from the iterator to the variable food. Okay, quick quiz. How many times would next need to be called before food gets assigned? The answer is twice. Once to start the iterator and the second time for this first yield. It's important that you remember that the number of next calls will not equal the number of yield statements. There will always be one extra next call to just start the iterator. Now back to the action generator function. The next line will want to ask the user for the serving size and save their entry. So add a yield expression here where the expression is the ask for serving size function. Since ask for serving size doesn't really use the food object except for passing it to the display calories function, we don't need to pass it as a parameter. We can pass the food object to the display calories function during the yield expression. Update the action it.next call to only pass serving size. The last step is displaying the calories, so just yield the display calories function with the serving size and food object as parameters. This covers all of the actions we were calling in the custom iterator. To start this iterator, we need to update the action it variable by replacing the action iterator call with the action generator call in the read line question. Now we call next to start the iterator. There's no need to pass the food object with the first next call since there's no yield expression waiting for a completion. The function has to run to its first yield, which is waiting for a food value to be passed back. So call next again on the action it and pass position.value back to the generator. We can run the program to make sure everything is still working as expected. And we're good. Coming up, we will add another feature to our program, the ability to list out what foods you logged for the current day. But first, 
Let's talk about yield delegation. In a generator function, the yield keyword is used to pause execution and to send values back out to the iterator. Since yield can send basically any value back to the iterator, I used to think, what if I wanted to send the values of a different generator function from this yield? That's when I learned about yield delegation. Yield delegation essentially allows a host generator function to control the iteration of a different generator function. I like to think of it as composing generator functions. Open up your code sandbox if you'd like to follow along here as we are going to write some examples of yield delegation. Let's define a generator function called gen1 and in this function we'll yield a couple of values 1 and 2. Now create a second generator function called gen2. Here is where we will use yield delegation. Type out yield star gen1. Yield star requires an iterable which is provided by invoking gen1. Now let's get the iterator from gen2. Underneath that, place a console log it.next call. This starts up the gen2 generator and runs up to the first yield statement, which in our case is a yield delegator. That delegator has started up the gen1 iterator and run to its first yield statement, which is sending a value of 1. Calling it.next again should take us to the yield2 statement in gen1. At this point, gen1 has run to completion. Let's add another yield statement below the yield star in gen2. Then call console log it.next again. Since gen1 has completed, gen2 has moved on to its own internal yield statements. What if you want to return a value from gen1 and save it to a variable? In gen1, you can add a return statement. Let's return 4. In gen2, we'll yield val and if we console log it.next again, we can see the value 4 appear. Now we are passing a generator function to yield star, but the iterable that is required doesn't have to be a generator function. You can pass any built-in or custom iterable. Let's remove the asterisk on gen1 to make it a normal function. Then instead of yielding something, just return an array of strings. Also remove the two extra yields from gen2. Now our console logs should reflect the strings returned in gen1. Now that we understand what yield delegation is, we should be able to implement it within our console log my food app. We've actually received a feature request which requires the application to be able to list out the foods we've logged for the current day. Head over to your editor and add a new switch case called today's log. The way we want this to work is the user would type today's log, then they'd enter their email address so we know what log to retrieve. We should then log out all of the foods eaten today, along with the total calorie count. First thing we'll need is a read line question. The text will just say email. The user would just type out their email and hit enter. Now we'll need an Axios GET request to the user's database and we'll filter by email address. Quick note, JSON server gives you the ability to do this type of quick filtering right out of the box. We know each user object has an email field available, so passing email as a query parameter means we want to filter all users by the provided email address. We'll grab the data object off of the response which will be an array of user objects. We will want the log from the first and only object on this array. Assign that to a variable called food log. Then create a variable called total calories with a value of zero. Now we want a generator function that will yield out all of the food logs from our user. So create a generator function named get food log and the only line we'll need inside is a yield delegator for food log. Food log is an array, meaning it's an iterable, which is required for yield delegation. We're going to use the get food log iterator to iterate over the food log iterable. This is yield delegation. 
we can use a for of loop over the iterator returned by get food log. We need to get the key of each entry, which is a timestamp from when the food was logged. So create a variable called timestamp and set that to object.keys entry and get the first item from the array. We need to check if the timestamps day matches the current day. Let's make a quick helper function called is today that will take in a timestamp and return true or false if that timestamp is from today. Create a variable today and set that to a new date object. Then we'll return three different equality checks. We'll check if the timestamp date matches today's date. We'll check if the timestamps month matches today's month. And we'll check if the timestamps year matches today's year. If all of those checks are true, then the function returns true. Otherwise, it'll return false. Back in our for of loop, we'll check if the timestamp is today. The timestamp will actually be in string form, so we need to read it as a number first. Then create a new date object from the timestamp so that we can get the date, month, and year off of it. If the timestamp is today, we'll log out the message food eaten and the serving size. Then we'll increment the total calories variable. Outside of the loop, let's log a divider line, then log the total calories. Put a read line prompt at the bottom here to bring the user back to the prompt. Now let's head over to the terminal and create a few more log entries for today. Now we can type out today's log, enter sam at acme.com, since that's our only user, and see our food log for today. And it looks like I have a typo somewhere, so let's go and fix that really quick. Now trying again, and there we see our day's food log. Using yield delegation to log out the food list gave us the benefit of not really having to care about how the food log was made. As long as the food log var is an iterable, our application would still work. We've abstracted the logic away from the generator that we're calling get food log. Hopefully you can see the benefits of yield delegation here and why it can be useful. Next up, we'll find out how we handle errors within a generator function and how can we complete the generator function early using a return method. Back when we were creating custom iterators, we talked about the optional methods return and throw. We implemented those manually before, but with generator functions, those are already included. We don't need to implement those ourselves. As a reminder, we use return or throw to abort the iterator before it would have normally completed. You'd use return when, for instance, you reached a pause point in the generator function and you have a value that tells you that you don't need to continue to the rest of the pause points. We are done, return. A throw, however, would be used if you would like to trigger an error within a generator. This is useful when you are consuming the iterator provided by the generator in a separate context, like maybe you have some promise that throws an exception and you want to stop the execution of your generator from the promises catch block. If the name of your iterator was its, you would just do its.throw from that promises catch block. Don't worry if you don't fully understand the use of these methods yet, we'll be using these both in console log my food. We actually already have a return in the code right now. If you remember, we added an escape keyword while logging food at the serving size step. If you enter the word never mind or just the letter n for your serving size, we call actionit.return, which ends the generator's sequence. Let's add another use of the return method. Take a look at our get food log function. A new feature request has just come in 
we are going to need to show a message to the user if their calorie amount goes over a certain value. For the sake of this example, we'll make that value 12,000. Those are world's strongest man eating numbers. If the user's calories go over 12,000, we'll print out a message to the console. First thing we'll want to do is create a variable to hold the iterator for get food log. Let's call it log iterator. Now in the if statement below the line where we increment the total calories, let's add another if block to check if total calories is above 12,000. If it is, log the message, impressive, you've reached 12,000 calories. Then call log iterator dot return. With this return in place, the generator will not log any more food items to the screen. Let's go ahead and create a few high calorie logs for the day. Log that you had chicken breast, 20 servings worth. Then maybe let's have 15 servings of apples. Then lentils, five servings. Add cheddar cheese at 10 servings. Add whole milk with 10 servings. Add 10 servings of ribeye steak. Then add eight servings of almonds. This should get us over the 12,000 calorie limit. Run the today's log command, and you'll see that after the ribeye was added, we went over 12,000. Since we returned and stopped logging foods, we won't see the almonds that we also logged. When we want to end a generator due to an error, we can use the throw method. Before we add this to console log my food, I want to show you an example of using throw over in code sandbox. Create a generator function named error handling, add a try catch block, and in the catch block we'll just log out the error message. In the try block, add three fields. Now let's create an iterator called error it by calling error handling. Log out the value of the first next call, which should be one. Next, call error it dot throw with an error message. As you can see in the console, our error message is reaching the catch block and logging. Try calling error it dot next again and you'll see that the number two is not logged, but instead done is true. Calling throw ends the generator execution. The same would happen if we were to throw an error inside the try block. Remove the error it dot throw call and instead place a normal throw call right after the first yield. Since we are already calling error it dot next twice, you'll see right away that throwing inside the try block ends the generator in the same way. This is similar to how error handling works with async await functionality. Okay, let's look at the log functionality and handle the case where the user enters a serving size that is not a number and is not our escape hatch string of never mind or the letter n. We'll want to call throw on the iterator, which will stop the generator from reaching the display calories action. First, we'll want to add a try catch block to the action generator to handle any errors thrown. Let's wrap what we currently have in the function in the try section. In the catch block, we'll console log whatever error message is passed into the throw command. Now we need to add an additional else if condition in the ask for serving size function. After checking for never mind or in, add an else if. Here we'll check if the type of serving size is not a number or if the serving size is NAN. If either of these are true, we'll call actionit.throw with the error message, please, numbers only. We really should update our other generator functions with try catch blocks for better error handling. Go up to the list vegan foods function and let's wrap that logic in a try block. For the catch block, Let's just print out the error message, something went wrong while listing vegan items, along with the error object. The last generator function is the get food log function in the today's log section. Wrap the yield delegation in the try block and in the catch block log the error object and the message error reading the food log. Well, you've made it through the generator's module. 
Throughout this module, we took what we learned about iterators and iterables and applied it to the implementation of generator functions. We learned that generator functions return iterators that can be advanced with next calls or within a for of loop. We learned that generators introduce the yield keyword, which provides a pause point within the function and gives the iterator control of the function's flow. We talked about yield star or yield delegation, which lets one generator function control the flow of another generator function. We went over how to complete a generator before all code has been executed using the return method on its iterator. And finally, we learned how to handle errors within a generator function and how we can use the iterator's throw method to trigger an error. Coming up, we'll look at a library called Cancelable Async Flows, or CAF. CAF is a library that makes generator functions look and work like an async function that has the ability to be canceled. Async functions are usually used more often than generator functions, so for those who just prefer the look of an async function, CAF can be very useful. In the next module, we'll learn how to use CAF.